into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. What's up? Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to... I think this is going to be a thank you for your service. And I don't know which number. I think I'm hereby officially not numbering those anymore. Just because uh, I'm anti-numbering podcasts. Roman numeral them. I was Roman numeral them. Oh, you were? Them. I thought it was looked cool for a little yeah. while. But it doesn't actually function in any way or serve any purpose. I don't the, think. The nice thing about Roman numerals is no one actually knows what they mean. So you can... Just put whatever lines and V's and dashes and people will nod along and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Welcome to Thank You For Your Service, M... Uh, M-V-I Alpha. Can't you do L's oh at some point? That means like a hundred or a thousand or some shit? Um, well, are they... Are they uh, lowercase L's or uppercase I's? That's what I never got. I don't with know. The Roman numerals. It's, it's confusing. Yeah. Um, welcome to Thank You for Your Service. Uh, M. Uh, I. L. F. No, that's not <laughs> good. <laughs> Melief. No, I mean. Like a MILF, but uh, French. I'm trying to do an episode here where we respect our women, our comrades in the sex work industry, and I'm already making MILF jokes, and it's that way off. The- we're already way off the rails. Um, we're going to talk to Excuse me. one of the strippers from the NoHo stripper strike, which is happening in Los Angeles right now, a little bit later. That's Did you say NoHo stripper strike? Like n- North Hollywood. They have a NoHo there, too. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's very confusing. There's Soho and NoHo here, and it has yeah. to do with Houston Street or something. Right. Over there, it's Hollywood. Okay. And then you watch this show, Barry, and there's this guy, NoHo Hank, and you're like, which one is he from? Mm. But I think it's... I guess well, Hollywood. Probably. In LA, right? But he's like Albanian or some shit, so it's... Is there a NoHo there, you think? There's a, there's one in uh, London. I know that there's at least a Soho in London. I don't know what it's the Ho is in that case either. But. Yeah, they just do this in every city. It doesn't make any sense. Right. In the, Do you think in the North Pole there's a NoHo Ho Ho? <laughs> the very North... Of the North. Yeah, you can, if you uh, are bullshitting with somebody and you run out of Roman numerals to throw out, you can be like, oh, you're from St. Louis, NoHo, or Soho. There you go. Yeah. There's always one in every... Right. Like a like Highland. That's a neighborhood that's in basically every city. Yeah. Yeah. I live off of MLK it's... in Soho. Mm. You know? Yes. Um... <laughs> And then you're in case you're yeah you're like undercover or something and you need to improvise. No one will ever decode that you. Remember just when I asked up. that guy when I got scammed and he said he was John from Houston, <laughs> and I was like, oh, and we were on the the Zoom at the time. We should have recorded it, but I was like, oh, my friend Jake here is from Houston. What part? <laughs> <laughs> and instead of saying no ho Soho Highland South Side East Side, just bullshit. He could easily make something up, and he would. There's like a good chance he'd be right because every city has same neighborhoods. He said, "I am in bed with your wife." <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the part of New York that I live in right now. Ooh, uh, which- Milf. Yeah, Hood. there you go. To bring it back around, there we go. We did an improv herald. Um, that's well, that side of town is in every city too. You know, yeah, every city has at least one milf, or at I least hope. has has one person's wife that you could potentially oh, be in true. bed with. Yeah, unless know. it's a singles area only. All right. Well, speaking of uh, my wife. Welcome to the show. It's Borat. No, it's hi. I'm Jake Flores, and that's Anders Lee. Anders Lee here. Um, <clears throat> what's up? So we're gonna get into uh, yeah, the latest. Thank you for your service. Which I don't know if we've ever done one. Maybe I done one, but I. This is specifically a cool story. 
and it seemed uh, up the up my alley at least. I've literally been doing a joke on the tour where I'm talking about yelling at strippers and going, "Are you in a union?" So ah. somebody sent this to me, and I was like, "Well, that's serendipitous. Mm. I have to talk about this on my podcast about mm-hmm. labor and stuff." Um, but yeah, we're gonna get into that a little bit. But first, let's riff out some jokes. Let's talk a little bit about what's in the news. Um, you know. I'll, uh, this is the top of our comedy show, and we're, this is the monologue section. Jay Leno, everyone. You heard about this? You heard about this? He's a bunch of children were shot this week. You heard about this? <laughs> what did he do when something like that would happen? I don't what know. What did Jay Leno do after Columbine? Did they always... Yeah, because I feel like there's this weird thing where it's not... This isn't real, but it feels like... The news got darker over the last like five or ten years. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's like, "Oh man, there used to be all these mass shootings," and like they're kind of were. These ones reported on, right. but because of that phenomenon, there also weren't as many. Like now, because it's being reported on more, there are more moments where talk show hosts are like serious and they cry and stuff and are uh-huh. solemn and stuff. <laughs> and I don't know if Jay Leno was doing like the sh- does he still have a show? I felt like he was no. I think he might have like some sort of car show on some like app or something, but he doesn't have a talk show anymore. So I don't think he ever had to do it. I don't think he ever had to come out and like cry and then be in like a fucking dune buggy or whatever and be like, "It's so sad what happened in yeah. 9-11 today or whatever." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Letterman did do it. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, this it was they took like a week off. I think. For late night after 9-11. Might have been even longer. Um, but Letterman came out, guns blazing. By that, I mean eyes weltering with tears. John Stewart, of course. I don't think Leno had it in him to do that. <laughs> Mostly because he's a West Coast guy. You know, he's from Boston. That's his East Coast connection. And then moved to L.A. There's no love for New York in that man. Yeah. So Or D.C. Or sh- I should say Arlington, which is actually where the Pentagon was, not D.C. <laughs> You heard um, it here. Yeah, a lot of people in Arlington make that point. They're like, actually happened in, in Arlington, Virginia. Although, according to some uh, data, the Pentagon is legally in the district, even though it's geographically in Arlington. So I like to call it, uh, that's a big issue of contention. So all the Arlington talk show hosts at the time were were crying about their, their beloved Pentagon. Um Wow, interesting. Kind of like but, uh, Ridgewood in in uh, Brooklyn. There you go. Yes, good. We were talking before the show about this. Good segue uh, about have, and have I told this anecdote before on the show? You'll you'll tell me. I have a. I, don't know. I come from a long line of people who tell the same story <laughs> nine hundred times, which is not a great uh, aspect to have as a podcaster. But um, I've been telling this a lot lately because I've been hanging out in Ridgewood for s- certain things. But Whoa. I can't go into them on, on air. But Where's Virgil, Anders? <laughs> He's in Ridgewood <laughs> with me at my job that I can't disclose yet. I'm going to have a big reveal for what this job is, and everyone's going to be <laughs> minds blown. But um, Ridgewood used to be in Brooklyn up until the 1970s or early 80s. They had a congressperson by the name of Geraldine Ferraro. Which, uh, if you're not familiar, she's the type of person I would do my own episode on. Uh, She was the first female vice presidential nominee of a major party. Walter Mondale's running mate. Oh. Yeah. Which is it. He's from Minnesota. She's from New York. My parents are from Minnesota and New York. So I asked them recently if they had any fun tales about the 84 election. Um, Of course. Yeah. They do a little Halloween party. One is the other. Um, that would have been huge for them, but it says something. And you know what's even crazier? My old man is from Minnesota, mom from New York, and they were married and had uh, children in Washington, D.C. Minnesota and D.C. were the only two places that Mondale won. So, Damn. It all comes together. Magic um, is real. Yeah. I'm superstitious now. <laughs> Ooh, uh <laughs> So Geraldine Ferraro was representing this Ridgewood and other parts of Queens, but Ridgewood was in Brooklyn. The people of Ridgewood were like, we don't like paying Brooklyn taxes. We want to be in Queens. 
So he wouldn't want to be. And she personally saw to it that the post office committee changed the location of Ridgewood from Brooklyn to Queens, giving it ultimately the most confusing postage of all time. Um, yeah. Which I guess is just all of Queens, right? It's you. It's not only is it because in Brooklyn, it's just Brooklyn, New York zip code. Queens, it's you have to write the part of Queens that you're in when you send a letter to the person. Oh, that is so confusing. Yeah, I Plus don't know they why they do like, it that way. They have those crazy intersections where it's like 45th Avenue and 45th Street. Right. Also, there's like a third thing it could Place. be. There's a lot of places. Yeah. No, I've been saying this for years, and I don't care how much bullshit I get on the internet, how much <laughs> blowback I get. Queens is weird as hell, it's man. Weird. It's so fucking weird, it's weird, dude. One of the only places I didn't even know they had <clears throat> Boston Markets anymore, but there's a bunch in Queens. There's more than one, apparently. That's not Boston at all. Yeah. It's Queens. What a weird <laughs> place. And I don't care how controversial that statement is. <clears throat> yeah. It's someone has to say it. Queens needs to be called out or called in, depending on where you live. Yeah, I don't know if we could bring Queens in on the weirdness. We don't want to change Queens for being weird. It's fine the way it is. Are you all right? Um, <laughs> something went down the wrong pipe. That's all right. That'll happen. When you're talking about Queens, you get I know we all get very fired up. Yeah. Don't put that on that. I'm just I'm just <laughs> placing it there to see what the dimensions are, what the feel is. I'm putting a, a water glass on an upside down bottle cap. Andrews and has there's my no way it would it would work. All right, I'll put the water pressure over there. through the roof with this glass of water. <laughs> I, I'm keeping your you on your toes. Your, your <laughs> I know. Drink. I'm like <laughs> yes, yeah, it happens every time we podcast. <laughs> like we're gonna destroy all the equipment by knocking water over on it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, shit, man. Uh. Well, speaking of Brooklyn, you know, Ridgewood used to be in Brooklyn. You know who also used to be in Brooklyn? Who's that? Bernard Sanders. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that guy. Nard Dog back in the day. (laughs) little amazing segue there, if I do say so myself. It's pretty good. Yeah. I'm bringing him up because I feel like we don't talk about him enough on this podcast or podcast in general. Don't bring this man up. Yeah, he's been in the doghouse for a little bit since he didn't bring on the revolution. Yeah. But I still like him. He's he's uh, full of little fun stories, which is what I'm all about. I love a good political anecdote, which is why I went ahead and downloaded one of his uh, staffers. Ari Ravenhaft wrote a memoir of the campaign. And of course, I had to download it just to get all the inside juice gossip. Sorry if it's traumatizing for some people. I feel like uh, looking at the 2020 campaign or 2016 Either of Bernie's campaigns is kind of like um, there's a show on Netflix called um, what is it Resistance or something like that. But it's about the formation of the Irish Republic. And I can only watch till the Easter Rising, till the battle where they're occupying the post office. After that, I I have to turn it off because because they lose. Oh, yeah. And they get like it's it would have been an incredible thing if they had taken over. They beat the back the Brits as socialists, um, which was very close to happening. But yeah, although there was. Yeah. So we've talked about on the show tension between the nationalist and the socialist elements. I like that the, philosophy of watching movies, though. Just don't watch the part where uh, the tragedy. Yeah. Just edge, basically. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Just watch Titanic up until. Every, wow. What a great movie about a boat that. Had a, everyone had a great time on. Two people fucked on. Yep, that's it. End of movie. Nice. Wow, what a great porno movie that was. <laughs> a lot of intro leading up to it, but, you know. My heart will go on. You know what? This was shielded from me, actually, at the time, but in Titanic, he draws a nude portrait of her, right? Yeah. Do you see her areolas? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I think I saw it when it came out. It's PG-13, but areola is usually the the line for what makes it an R. Yeah. Well, I mean, this country is insane, and, like, laws about obscenity and stuff like that are completely bananas. So, like, as we've discussed plenty on the show with bleeping and blooping curse words and things like that, there might be some insane, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like... Censorship? Like, micro bylaw or whatever the fuck, um... Uh, exemption or whatever, right? Or Tasteful if, exemption. If it's like a, if it's drawn, it's right. okay. Um, yeah. 
nobody certainly ever becomes aroused by illustrations of things that's written before the internet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's right, like on The Simpsons, Itchy and Scratch. I mean, I guess the cartoon proper itself does get violent at some points, not, but not nearly as bad as Itchy and Scratchy. Like, they're watching a cartoon in a cartoon, and in the cartoon that they're watching in the cartoon, it's just no holds bar, blood, guts, gore, eyeballs popping out. Like, yeah, no. they go nuts, but they I don't think they would show that level of violence. People have gotten shot on The Simpsons, but not decapitated, like, in Itchy and Scratchy. Well, so, and some of the Halloween episodes, they go pretty hard. But but yeah. more importantly to this, and this, you know, this does kind of relate to, I think, the... the, the the anti-sex work sentiment that'll be discussed later in the show and stuff right. like that. Obscenity laws have always been really stupid, and they're imperfect and inconsistent and not based on any real, like, principle. So, right. like, you... I mean, especially in the 90s, you know, I I was a... Before I found out what he had been doing, <laughs> I was a fan of this guy john k who was the illustrator of ren and stimpy oh and okay. i wanted to be an illustrator when i was a kid for a little bit so i'd read his blogs and i did uh, not know what he <laughs> did yet but me and virgil texas would stay up all night reading his blogs together <laughs> <laughs> uh because we've been friends forever and we like to do cocaine in my apartment according to twitter um <laughs> this is obviously not true but uh, so uh but anyway so i used to read his blog and he would tell these interesting stories and i also like listened to the um i like, studied him like he was somebody like studied and did a portfolio about yeah. when I was trying to go to art school and he would talk also on like the DVD commentaries and stuff uh, on those shows about how like Ren and Stimpy if you remember if you're a, a child of the 90s as you refer to on the internet if you're the same age as me um, was like a demented like cartoon mm -hmm. like it was like Cronenberg body horror shit but it was a cartoon so it just yeah. flew under the radar somehow but there was like violence that was like disturbing it I th sure it played a large part into turning me into the interesting person i am today you know it's kind of traumatizing and stuff um but he would tell these interesting stories about how like they would they would because they the way that censorship works when you make a thing like that is like you get notes back and then like just because of the bureaucratic nature of the whole system the person who gives you the notes has to they have to feel like they've done their job every time they get an episode uh -huh. so what you do as the animator is you purposely put a bunch of really over the top shit in an episode, knowing that those are the things that the person is going to oh. then cut. That way, they'll leave the stuff that you wanted to keep in. Yeah. And uh, he would say sometimes they would cut the stuff that we wanted to keep, and they would leave the over the top stuff, which is why <laughs> you'd have an episode where just some insanely violent thing would happen in like graphic oil painting and shit, close ups and shit like that. Because he's like, that's what we put that in as the Easter egg, like the trap or whatever. Yeah. Um, cause this is, you know, a largely inconsistent, impossible thing to really regulate. And it's like one of the hilarious things about American media is that there's somebody, you know, whose job is to like whip out a fucking ruler and be like, this is three quarters of a butt cheek at any given time. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're showing Sipowitz's ass on TV or whatever, stupid, right. stupid thing. And, uh, you know, right. But, they have such oddly specific that like you can't say asshole on network tv but if you do say it then and they bleep it they bleep out the hole and not the ass which for like whatever a, reason which is a not a normal word hole you know yeah yeah and you can show stuff with his ass after tv but this is what lenny bruce and fucking george carlin were talking about before everyone went insane and thought that they were like punisher tattoo guys which people think now you know right well it's funny i was watching a lecture from michael parenti a couple months ago, and, he just, and it was during the lecture was during uh, Glasnost in the Soviet Union, where they're kind of easing censorship restrictions and um, just letting artists, artists and writers be. Uh, did I just say artists? Like <laughs> yeah. that's a, a hybrid thing. People should start self-identifying as artists or rightists. Rightists. Oh uh, well, yeah, that's already kind of a thing. But that sounds cooler. <laughs> um, but apparently, writers. Got writer's block when they listed all the or when they lifted all the censorship rules in the Soviet Union because they were like, well, well, now what the fuck do I do? I can. Oh, you know I mean, like a comedian, your job is to cross the line. So yeah. Take the line away. It's right. Like, well, now I'm bored. You know. Yeah. I could do anything, and now there's no interesting. Yeah. That's why that didn't lead to a bunch of. Well, I mean, it did probably lead to stuff that we could analyze from that angle, but not equipped currently. Yeah. 
um, ultra edge lords, maybe in the late Soviet Union or something. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, speaking of writers, this book written by Ari Rabinhaft, doing a mini review. There's so many good little anecdotes in here that are a lot of fun. <clears throat> Apparently, uh, Amy Klobuchar gave a ride to Bernie when he was coming to Minnesota. They happened to be on the same flight. She insisted that they sit next to one another. He enjoyed himself, apparently. But <laughs> afterwards, he was going to catch a cab with his staffers to the hotel. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. I got a car coming. My husband's going to pick me up. I believe it was her husband. <laughs> and I will drive you. We will drive you, the Klobuchar clan, to your hotel. And Bernie's like, are you sure? And she's like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so they cram into the car. There's not enough room for everybody. And so Klobuchar just says to one of Bernie's staffers, I think probably a strapping young man, uh, you can sit in my lap. <laughs> so she had some guy sit in her lap. You can sit in my lap. I can picture that. Yeah. It's kind of hot. A little hot. But the um, one of the ones I found the most interesting was actually about the Blasio. Because you remember a few years ago where there were, it seemed like he and Bernie were coming, becoming buddy-buddy. Yeah, I remember that. And he came to Bernie's lake place, and there's pictures of it. I was like, that's surprising. Like, there are definitely worse Democrats than de Blasio, but I didn't really think of him as, like, on the Bernie tier of politician. But apparently, according to this book... Some tea spills about de Blasio being sort of uh, sycophantic in a way like he he insists that Bernie come and swear him in for his second term as mayor for his inauguration. And it's like actually pretty inconvenient for Bernie, but he is just like wants to be nice. And so he does it. And he says, uh, Robin Half writes that de Blasio really wanted to be tapped as Bernie's successor. <laughs> Like nationally, politically, I think pro part of him probably wanted Bernie to not run in 2020 and instead endorse de Blasio's insane uh, pipe dream of a campaign. Yeah. Um, but that's ambitious of him. <laughs> yeah. He says uh, beyond the tap that. <laughs> right. Uh, and he says this is just not something that Bernie would have done. Uh, and then de Blasio insisted, he uses the word insisted, on visiting Bernie and Jane in Vermont the following summer, spending a day in August at the uh, their cabin on Lake Champlain. And this is where the pictures come from. Bernie shirtless, taken by a tabloid. Uh, like, that. that is very weird that um, de Blasio would demand basically that he be invited invite himself over to the to the cabin maybe yeah. Bernie should have put his foot down but anyway we've all got that one friend you know yeah the, the de blasio of the group right does it quite get it yeah that you're not allowed dick we don't really want you to come over to our cabin oh shit are you in this group chat bill de blasio oh fuck we were making fun of him for like an hour uh oh yeah <laughs> yeah, he's gonna have a slumber party with the the squad and Shama Sawant, and then Big Bird shows up. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot of funny stuff in here. I don't know. Maybe we should save it for our paywall. Getting entrepreneurial here, <laughs> getting more cutthroat. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you think there's some juice in there that people need to pay for? I'm all for it. I um. I, I liked. I saw Bernie throw out the opening pitch of a baseball game this week, and I thought that was fine. Um, that was good. Oh, there's a lot about that in here also, about his love of minor league baseball. He, he thinks that minor league baseball is like the fabric of middle America, and like that's like the only thing that a lot of communities have that's like a actual communal event because everybody's so like atomized and all that. Yeah, that's and, interesting. Yeah, and his formative political experience was having the Brooklyn Dodgers taken away and sent to Los Angeles. So when he's at spring training, he wants to go to spring training. Um, so he goes to Dodgers spring training and he's wearing a Brooklyn Dodgers hat. They try to get him to put on an L.A. hat, a new one, and he refuses. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. 
I these are my doyos. That's how you say it if you're Mexican in LA. Yeah. Um I let's go back to Klobuchar for a minute. You just reminded me of something when you brought her up. Sure. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when she was tweeting about how like we need to make uh this Yeah, she week tweeted um a, a, po- a police, a holiday in honor of the police. It's the week that George Floyd was murdered. Oh, that's what I th- see. I thought she was uh, plugging the band Millions of Dead Cops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, for, it, off the record, she's hardcore. You know, <laughs> she's fucking down, dude. She lives in uh, Bushwick. In <laughs> what is that band called, by the way? Did I f- just fuck that up? No, MDC, Millions of Dead Cops. Of millions of cops. Excellent reference on your part. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, fucking rules. Um, yeah, she, <laughs> but she like. I guess I was just thinking about how funny that is in, in retrospect, like in, in light of recent events, because uh, it was fucked up. It's the week George Floyd is murdered in Minneapolis. Yeah. She comes out saying, oh, this is going to be like a, a you know a holiday to um to honor the police, which obviously if you are an anti-police person, you maybe caught wind of this and went, hey, that's fucked up. But most people, by nature of the political machinations that we discuss on this show so much, these stupid mayor races and stuff like that have come all the way back into being brainwashed that we just need to give the police more money and stuff like that. But then some things happened this week that this is a lighthearted podcast. We don't right. have to go into great detail about, <laughs> but the fucking cops don't look very good in it. And it's, I, it's funny in retrospect, cause I, th- I think maybe like that looks stupid now. Um, and I'm sure everyone will just forget all this stuff and forget the ideological side of this and go back to being a dumbass that wants to give money to cops pretty soon. But, um, it's been a funny week. Cause like, You've even seen like uh like Michael Tracy was tweeting a thing where he really? was saying, I mean, he literally said that the police abolitionists were maybe right about this, and ah. I think he thought he was making some kind of hot take, but he literally is just admitting, you know, that he was wrong, and that right. the fucking problem here is the institution. Um, so I don't know. Good a time as any to, you know, a cab and fuck the police and all that shit. Yeah, it's um, like there's a there's a carrot and a stick argument. I think like the there's so many problem. There's so many uh, solutions have just kind of empowered and emboldened the police and uh, and incentivized bad bad behavior, quote unquote. Uh, that it's hard to really envision. Uh, any sort of practical steps forward that don't involve like just taking away money and resources from them, you know, and that yeah. can be kind of a difficult political pitch. But I think if you are really clear to people about, uh, we do need to promote public safety and bring down crime. It's just like it has not, and I'm preaching to the choir and saying the kicking a dead dog uh dead horse rather on this i know with our audience but like uh we've it, the problem is not that they don't have enough money right that i just don't know how people can make that argument like, i think this you has have been a- an issue in in some new york city races where bail reform has come up as this is the issue that is leading to the spike in violence and violent crime when uh it didn't go into effect until after that spike that was a nationwide thing related to covid we passed bail reform in 2019 it's enough it's a to stop people who like were not uh, a threat to anybody from being detained and just wasting public money uselessly uh and that's being used of course as a as a political football to to just you know crack down and, and just keep doing the same stuff that just you know that and that's but the hardest part to break through is like we have tried this. This is, you know, the cops not having enough money is is not the issue. Like it just has nothing to do with, um, you know, rising in, in violent crime and stuff. Yeah, I think you're you're right to uh, to see this as beating a dead horse. Given like explaining the actual fucking overall problem to people that listen to this podcast. But something I will I think is important to talk about that's within what you're just saying is like and i hate to sound like a fucking lib about this or whatever but just like messaging or whatever Uh like every time you talk to anyone about this who isn't on board they think that you're saying like i want there to be like anarchy in the sense of like in a batman movie like no it's just crime run rampant 
And it's important to have like a, bu- a bunch of notes to refer to about this and go like, right. no, no, I'm talking about solving crime in a, better than the police can, yeah. you know, because <laughs> a lot of the stuff is preventative. And then a lot of it is like, yeah, the police don't do their jobs when there's someone shooting a gun at people. But like a social worker of some kind might be better adept at that situation. It might be literally a social worker also with like a gun or something. There's like a million different directions you can go with this. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, something resembling a police officer. But like the point is the institution is rotten to the core as it is. So like this just needs to be reimagined. S- similar problems being solved through different, you know, uh, different jobs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Because like m- people think, I mean, it's it's fun to freak these people out. Because they are our political enemies, but they literally just think like, that you mean like, I want cr- to reward criminals or whatever. You know, I want yeah. there to be fucking street gangs and stuff. Right. I've actually been thinking a lot lately about because so much. I is- do want to reward criminals, but uh, you know, the the kind that are good, smooth criminals. Yeah, <laughs> the big gay do crimes kind, not the white collar kind. Right. Um. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot lately about because so much of this is tied to municipal budgets. And this is sort of by design during the Cold War, sort of uh, public planners were like, we just want to be the opposite of the Soviet Union. Therefore, we're going to make policing and law enforcement completely decentralized in America. We want to be like the equal and opposite of the Soviet Union. Um, so that's why it's so hard to get any federal stuff through um, to reform policing, quote unquote. Um, but because it's so tied to, to budgets now, and that's what the, the debate is over, is like, do you defund? What does that mean? Do they need more money? Uh, what if, like, what if there was just a some sort of national law which would be, you know, possibly more difficult to rebuff than um, just talking about the funding mechanisms. If you were to say, if there's any infraction that meets such and such a threshold, then the police officer should be fired on the spot. And this is going to be enforced federally. Like, I think definitely one place to start and that I also think would be is very hard to argue with. It just seems kind of common sense is that anytime there's an officer involved death there should be a an investigation from the DOJ. Like, that should be automatic. Um, you mean the police shouldn't investigate themselves and then say <laughs> they, they, it turns out they didn't do anything wrong? Yeah. And the thing is, who who it's kind of like who watches the watchers, who enforces the enforcement of the enforcers, if you will. Like, uh, that Rolls we tried right to, off the tongue, that y- phrase. <laughs> yeah. Like, the civilian review boards mostly just don't have teeth anywhere, you know? So if this was to be a national thing, you would need, yeah, you would need like some uh, federal militia to kick down the doors of local police officers and arrest them and, you know, sign up. If you're one of those uh, socialists in the Rifle Association, we need you for this, this militia that will arrest police officers. Yeah, I like that. Imagine if there was an external thing that audited the police it's just it seems like stuff like that just gets absorbed into the police or mobbed up or whatever yeah easily Uh. yeah i think that yeah there are a lot of solutions that i'm hesitant to say popular but from my you know obviously very skewed perspective i i have a hard time seeing what the opposition would kind of muster other than straw manning, which they're going to do no matter what. But if we're trying to, you know, reach people who aren't sure about this and we say, should the police have military grade weapons? Probably the answer would be no, I would hope, I would think, uh, you know, that's that's a good place to start from. But I think, yeah, I've just been thinking lately about how maybe this does have to be more centralized. The response to uh police departments which are scattered all about they have like networks and they work together they're connected with the military but it's kind of by design that they're fractured and they're all these little hubs of just you know murderous power um if you were to address it all head on uh i think that would stand a better chance than 
maybe just trying to do them do them one by one. I think we need some sort of like sweeping overhaul from at the national level. Yeah. I think that a good test for whether or not you need a police officer in any situation, whether your 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 local police department is overfunded and unnecessary is ask yourself this. In any given situation, would it have been better if not a police officer, not a cop had showed up, but a stripper dressed like a cop? Ooh. I think this is like a Bechdel test type of thing. You could apply to a lot of different situations. Yes. Most situations, you would have been better off with the stripper, probably. <laughs> oh, yeah. Even in this mass shooting that I'm dancing around referring to, right. 19 cops didn't do shit. I bet one stripper could have gotten in there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Get, getting as more legitimate work here. Right. It, you know? It always it makes people feel better. You know? It brings the vibe up. Uh-huh. Everyone loves it. Fuck the social worker thing. Let's just go straight to strippers. That is social work, my friend. It is. They'll be true. funded by the government under my model. Yeah. Tax dollars will go. Uh, you'll go and you'll throw tax dollars at these people and make it rain funding. There you go. Um... Obviously, I am segueing into the interview this week uh, that we did, talking to Tess from the NoHo Stripper Strike um, about what's going on. A little background, if you are entirely unfamiliar with uh, what's happening, is that there's something really cool happening in um, in North Hollywood, as we discussed at the top of the show, NoHo. Um, the workers of a particularly uh, hostile workplace known as Star Garden are forming uh well they're on strike they're possibly forming a union and nice. uh all of this has to do with the intricacies of california's recent adoption of what is called ab5 bill 5 or whatever california bill 5 which basically what it does is i guess the meat of this which maybe i wanted to bounce off you anders you have any you want to bounce off bounce meat off me yeah <laughs> something you can do i'm about to call i the, mean i'm not a cops even a on stripper, you, you but i can know what i'm saying yeah um, well, okay, so what do you think about this? It seems like the central conflict is, um, or at least part of this story, is that this bill actually changed a lot of workers, like strippers, from independent contractors to employer employees, mm -hmm. but it isn't playing out well. It isn't yeah. playing out in the way that it's supposed to, and that employ employers are finding ways to get around a lot of what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, or just not really doing anything, and there's no oversight. They're not being forced in any way to like provide the benefits required to employees, right? Uh, to their workers, because it's like I don't know, like a the, the, no one's ever done this with this model of like work before and stuff like that. And it's like you know an off the books thing. I don't know. What do you think about all that? Well, it's just I, kind of a boxing match, you know. The I think we talked about this, and we were in a a capital reading group capital with an a about you know at certain points uh when you punch capital they're gonna punch back you know the example i think were was the uh that was one of the first labor laws in the history of of england or britain uh and capital had a response to it the industry um tried to skirt it and and, and like they're gonna do that no matter what yeah um so I think you have to be prepared to, to counterpunch and um, counterpunch in a way that isn't is necess isn't necessarily on the same terrain. You know, I think that's that when you are looking at like a legislative strategy, as it, as it sounds like the the uh, organizers here are thinking about, like when you you pass a, a law, right? That's nice, but it's only as good as the paper it's written on. If you have um, organization you're able to counterpunch right and make sure that the law is enforced you may not you mean legally you're not enforcing the law but you're you're fighting back uh against the against the boss right and, and you have to do that on on multiple fronts um it's just a series of platitudes but i think they no you're right though yeah yeah uh, it's a boxing match yeah and it's multi-pronged right, right? Yeah. It's a oh. multi pronged boxing match. Well, we're gonna talk to Tess a little bit about that, but I think what's going on is that they're yeah, they're both like uh there's a legal aspect to this and then the labor aspect too, which is right. 
some kind of power I hear about. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the strength of socialism and Marxist analysis is you know that, again, the law is words, right? It's it's could lead to some good outcomes, right? But it, it has to be enforced, you know? Um, this is, and this comes up with, like, civil rights laws all the time is uh, they say... A lot of the civil rights laws throughout this country are pretty good, but there's no it's not like the the DOJ, once again, is going around just, you know, inspecting random businesses to make sure that they're complying. Right. You you hear about the really egregious examples, but there's all kinds of examples that are maybe not as extreme that just float on by because we that enforcing these things is, is not a priority in this country. It never has been. Uh, and if it does become one. It's not going to be co- because uh, we got you know the best legal minds in there. It's going to be because we, be because we have organization. Totally. All right. Well said. All right, everyone. Well, uh, let's get into the interview. Thank you for your service. Number question mark. Let's with. go to the tape. Let's go to the tape. All right. I'm now speaking with Tess from uh, Stripper Strike NoHo, the uh, ongoing stripper strike you may have heard about happening in. California right now. Uh, Tess, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, This is interesting. Uh, I've been reading about this kind of along the tour I've been on. I've been on tour opening for this band called Eve Six for the last month or so. Um, I'm not sure if they get played in clubs like yours. (laughs) A little bit more (laughs) bubblegum. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe the song, I might know it. (laughs) Uh, Oh my God. I'm going to have to come in sometime and request someone dance to the heart and the blunder song no that doesn't sound fun at all actually um but anyway so i I heard about this story and um and uh a friend of the industry myself so i you know it's important i think to talk about but also i i'm a comedian right and i've been doing this joke and the joke is about how uh i don't really like 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 strip clubs and it's not because i'm like morally against them it's just because i'm like too working class so like whenever i go into a business i immediately side with the employees against the customers and uh you know so it's like hard for me to get into it because i'm like you know what's up bro you working hard up there you know (laughs) and like um and so like uh but then i have this line in it where i'm yelling at the stripper and i'm going what's up are you union and i've been yelling are you union at a theoretical stripper on stage for a month and then i fucked somebody sent me this story and i was like whoa you are union (laughs) cool um how serendipitous so i think it's almost um like our duty here to shine some light on this and hopefully help out a little bit um so thank you for coming on the show uh we talked to people about their jobs and ongoing labor labor you know organizing and stuff like that on the show a lot so there's nothing new for us but um but this seems like kind of a unique uh like strike you know you don't hear about this a lot with um you know the adult entertainment industry it seems like both people in in and out of the industry are a little averse to like the idea even of you being able to organize so let's um let's get into it tell me a little bit about like I guess the background that led into even someone coming up with the idea of striking at um, well, Star Garden is the name of the place, yeah? Yeah, Star Garden, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, honestly, I we never thought this was something that we would ever end up doing. I never thought that I would be like a stripper outside of my strip club striking with with other union members and, and other strippers. But yeah, what kind of gave us the idea is um uh so we have a sister organization the organization that we um unionize under and their name is uh strippers united and they have a really awesome lawyer you know shout out to jordan what's up girl and um she is um their organization is all about uh teaching uh like sex workers their rights and the laws and everything and then they just kind of turned us on to it and we're like I remember we were whispering about it, like me and Reagan and and Wicked were like, hey, you know, would you be down to unionize when the time comes? Because, you know, this strip club, you know, they they were doing a lot of stuff that was extremely illegal, you know, unmoral and just dehumanizing. And we can totally go into details about that. Um, But yeah, what happened is they were just firing chicks like left and right. First, they 
they fired one girl because she didn't sell enough dances during the night. And the ne- the previous night, she'd sold like $300 worth of dances. And also this club is taking 50% of our dances. So that's, you know, that's a whole other different thing. Yeah. So then they fired Reagan. And so Reagan had brought up this issue that she was having. And, you know, this happens in, you know, in, in our industry, there are going to be some dudes that, you know, they're going to be creepy. They're going to be obsessive. They, they could follow you home, you know, in their car and, you know, and, and strippers have been killed by customers. So she was feeling, you know, unsafe. And so she brought it up to management, you know, can the customers like a really simple request, can the customers leave after they're done finishing their dances? Cause they were letting, you know, select customers stick around until like three and we're all yeah. dressed in our, you know, normal clothes and we're cashing out and, you know, we can't quite break character because there's, there's this dude that's here. So anyway, she brings it up to management, management blames her. Uh, like, what are you doing to lead this dude on? Let's not take any responsibility and do what we're supposed to do. And just, you know, ask these dudes to leave after, you know, the night's done at 2 AM. But instead he just blames it on her. He tells her jokingly, you know, and maybe it was a joke for him, but it was definitely not a joke for her that you're going to get murdered by this customer and, and how it was going to happen. And and then they got in a really big fight and she was fired the next day. And yeah. then a couple days later or later that week, um, another stripper, she had, you know, saw this dude filming this other stripper on stage. And that's, you know, that's illegal. You can't be filming people in the strip club. And so she goes over and she asks him like, yo, you can't do that. Delete it. And the security guards are doing nothing. They're just watching it all like, you know, watching us try to get this dude to delete this freaking video. And, and then she gets fired the next day. So that, you know, that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And we're like, all right, let's do this. Let's, let's walk out. So we, we all, all, um, God, how many of us are, (laughs) so there are 25 dancers and 25 had signed this petition requesting for safer working conditions, um, requesting uh, for fair working conditions and a renegotiation of um, an illegal contract um, that they had some of us sign. And also to, you know, can we, we wanted to rehire the girls that got fired and, and we handed them that petition um, at the time I wasn't there cause I fell off the pole and I injured my rotary cuff. So I was busted at the time, <laughs> but I was definitely like outside in my wig. I'm like, all right, we're doing this. I'm really scared, but okay, let's do this. And, um, so the manager wasn't there. They handed the petition to, um, the bartender and, ha- you know, got the owners on, on the phone and she was super sick. She's like, Hey, if you don't feel safe, you can, you guys can, you don't have to work here tonight. You can walk out. So then all the dancers who were working that night walked out and, and she was said like, Hey, let's talk about this petition in the morning. So anyways, um, we come back to the club and there's a red velvet, you know, uh, what are those things? Uh, red velvet, um, like. Oh, the the weird little thing. like what, like. What, I'm like, what you're is not that supposed word? to walk here on the walkway. Yeah, sort yeah, of thing. and they they like they locked us out. They said you cannot come into work unless you speak to management individually. So then that's when it started happening. We started picketing. We started organizing. We started doing. Um, we started filing unfair law practices, uh, reporting, uh, you know, PPP loan frauds, reporting over 30 OSHA violations, picketing outside of the club for two months and, uh, and unionizing. Yeah. I think it's called a velvet rope is what that's just called. Yeah. That's the word rope (laughs) that I could not fucking remember. I was like, damn, I look dumb right now. No, no. It happens all the time. I had me thinking too. I was like, I think I'm overthinking this. Rope. Like a, 
<laughs> I'm like, uh, that thing, the string. But um, yeah, no, that's really interesting because I mean, it seems like there's a, like a litany of things that lead into like a critical mass occurring where you just go, okay, this is like enough. But like, um, like the PPP loan thing you just said, that's like a you know rampant problem with what happened in 2020 is all these businesses just sort of kept all that shit for themselves and didn't really expense any of it out to the workers and stuff, right? Like that has to be yep. happening really bad. And in, in you know, I mean, I don't know, like. I don't know how the, I don't know whether there are like really good strip clubs to work for and really bad ones or whatever. But like my theory on a lot of this stuff is just like Americans don't talk about how shitty small businesses can be in general. And a lot of them, you know, when you have like, like I'm a comic, so there's similar stuff when you just work at a club or something. There's like, um, they take advantage of you because you're, you're, you're hired gun and you, um, you know, your family, you know, they always use that kind of against you. Like, no, 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 we love you, you know, and stuff. So like, uh, I've seen a lot of this stuff, you know, a lot of the PPP loan stuff happen in comedy clubs for sure. I mean, we never saw any of that. The, the fucking people that, you know, put on the show that brings people in that sells the nachos and stuff. Um, but I was also reading about like, um, like the, the practices of like requiring quotas, like you to make a certain amount of money just to work there and stuff yeah. like that. That was a big, you know, that was definitely a really important thing to the owners and, they would really push us like, Hey, you need to sell dances. Cause this is, you know, how we make money. And they would, um, they had a quota of selling five dances, you know, each night. And, you know, they would even turn off, they would close down the stage if we were not selling dances within that hour, which is fucking wild because I've never seen that in any strip club. <laughs> and so we were like, well, we really want to get back on stage because, you know, Star Garden is a stage club for the most part. So, you know, we put on a good show and and we love being up there performing. So we're like, hu like hustling, like, hey, man, can you please like get a lap dance so they can turn the stage back <laughs> on? And you know, that's, I've never, I've never heard that happen. Usually it's just this like, you know, ever, you know, never ending cycle of, of dancers, but yeah, like having, you know, they had their techniques, you know, of, you know, getting us to sell dances. I've, I've even worked at other strip clubs where they would blast the air conditioning in, uh, in the dressing room to get the strippers to come out. So then they would work Jesus. the floor. Um, but, you know, uh, aside from, you know, their quotas, uh, they, they did not provide um, proper security. So that was one of the, you know, one of the things that really set this off yeah. is so this, the security guards are not allowed to interfere in our dances. And also they don't even really like have rules for what happens in the lap dance area. So, you know, the lap dances, they're, they're not private. They're in the corner. Everyone can see you, but um they're, you know, dudes get drunk and they get really handsy and, and some of them get violent. And, you know, we had one dancer that um, a, the dude picked her up and he dropped her on the ground during the lap dance and then fell on top of her. Oh, my God. And the next day she quit. She's like, OK, I can't handle this. And she even sent a message to management and they didn't even respond. So um, Reagan, she had gone to because, you know, sometimes like, okay, this dude is, he, you can tell when a dude's going to be a little like handsy or, or, you know, a little bit crazy. So we expect the security to have our back because we all work as a team, you know, like if a, if a security guard is going to bring me a customer, I'm going to break him off 15%. And then also if shit gets crazy, I need you to have my back. So, you know, Reagan had went up to the security guard. She's like, Hey, I think this dude's a little, you know, might be a little crazy. Just have my back in there while I'm giving a dance. Yeah. And so, I mean, the dance went fine, but then afterwards the security guard goes and talks to her and he says, Hey, I'm not allowed to like, you know, mess with your dances at all. And that is, that's, that's dangerous, you know? Yeah. And, and even after, you know, the, you know, uh, Selena got fired for you know, getting that customer to delete that that video. Um, she got fired and then they rallied up all the strippers in the dressing room. Um, Jenny did. And she said, hey, if there are any problems in the strip club, you need to go to management first. Don't go to the security guards. So then they can deem whether it's a big enough, you know, is this 
problem worthy of security getting involved. So they just take the power away from the fucking security guards and it, it defeats the purpose of that job. And, and it makes it more dangerous for, for the dancers. And we've had a lot of wild shit go on there. We've had, you know, guys grab strippers by the leg and pull them all the way, you know, across the stage. We'd had dudes with like, like slapping us as hard as they can with like dollar bills and, and, you know, and also crazy dances. And, you know, it's, it's, it's North Hollywood. It's not super hood, but it's a little hood. So you never know what kind of characters who are going to walk in and yeah, you need security. Strippers need security. Yeah, no, that seems like a completely fucked system of not allowing the security to do their jobs in that situation. And how are you going to run to the background manager? That's pretty fucked up. Um, can we talk about the owners of this place, or is that a bad idea? I'm I a, mean, what do you want to know? <laughs> I'm just curious about them because they're like, um, they're like a married couple, right? They are, they're a couple, they're married. Um, they are, they are new management actually. So, um, the original, there was different owners that had, um, had, you know, had the garden prior to, you know, the shutdown and everything. And then Jenny and Steve, they picked it up afterwards. And so they own another club in Long Beach and, um, and it's a pretty big club. That's like their uh, their main club that they focus on. And yeah, they're definitely they're they're interesting characters. Um, they don't really hire hire staff. They they show up. They do the bartending. Sometimes they're doing the sometimes they're the DJ. Sometimes the security guard is the DJ, and they just like understaff that club like crazy to save a couple bucks. Yeah, and you know. You know, a bartender, that, that is a skill. A, 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 a DJ, that's a skill. You need to have <laughs> skills to do those jobs. You can't just do that shit yourself. Yeah, the owners always think, well, I own the place, therefore I must be I must be good at all the jobs, you know, and then they'll just come in. And I've been, like, bartending before, and you know, have the owner drunk, get behind the bar and want to help, but it's like you're hurting more than you're helping. You just get the fuck out of here, dude. Um, well, I guess I was just curious because I knew that they owned that other club, and I was like, okay, so to me this this – the story here seems to be, you know, that these are small business owner, little little capitalists, little petty bourgeois type people that yeah. are cutting yeah, corners because in their mind, the story is, look, we're opening places and expanding our, our little empire. And that's that's the enemy here. Right. Um, and I also I guess I was curious about that because I was reading something about y'all and someone mentioned at one point the goal being like, you know, if you properly unionize collective ownership of the strip club or something like that. Is that something that might be, you know, in the, with the plans at some point? Um, it's an ambitious idea, but I'm, I'm really into, you know, cooperatively run workspaces and stuff like that. Um, is that possible in this industry? I don't know. I mean, Hey, they passed the AB five law. It forced, you know, a bunch of people that were independent contractors to be employees, strippers included, which is crazy. But, (laughs) um, yeah, if, you know, if they recognize our union, we can renegotiate contract. And then when they want to make changes in their business, you know, we can all work together. And I mean, honestly, that's the best way to, to have, you know, to create a better business. Why not have more, you know, more perspectives? Like we know a lot of shit that's going on that they not, they are not seeing because they're not, they're not dancers. And then also, you know, getting perspective of, you know, the other people who are stabs. I mean, I would love for like us to, you know, work together. And you know, that, that is definitely a goal, you know, and we, we want to talk to them. Like, let's get on the phone. Let's do this, you know, but they're avoiding us like a plague. Um, (laughs) You mentioned this bill AB five that uh, when it passed, it changed a lot of worker in California's status from independent contractor to employee which is a good thing because that you know the classification of independent contractor is how they keep you from being able to qualify for like benefits and all sorts of worker protections and stuff like that um but it seems like the situation is that they're like are they're they're finding loopholes and ways around sort of providing you with the things that the employment status is supposed to give you or are they just or are they just outright not abiding to what the bill says you're supposed to do both 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so a lot of clubs, um, this club in particular, what they're doing is they're, um, we're paying a, we're paying rent for a studio. And that's, that's what some clubs have done. They're just, they're taking 50% of your dances and saying that is rent that you are paying for to, to dance in their space. Other clubs are, um, they're paying you an hourly wage, but then they charge back um, what they paid you in dances. So they just straight up take like $200 right off the top of whatever you're making Yeah. on, on top of the 50% split, which is just their, you know, their, their, their business model isn't, you know, it isn't made, you know, it, it wasn't built with this AB5 law, you know, in, in mind. So right. they're just trying to cut corners and make it work or, or maybe try to keep it the way it was. But, you know, ultimately it has really affected dancers, like chicks who don't have, you know, chicks who aren't American, you know, um, who are working in strip clubs, you know, they can't work in certain clubs now because, because of this employee status, they don't have, you know, a social security number. Um, and also we're, we're, we're paying more money and some clubs are limiting this, you know, the amount of dancers because, you know, some clubs are abiding by the law and they can't afford all those employees. So there's, there's a lot of things that these clubs have been doing to either work with or around like this new law. Well, it's not super new. It came out like 2018, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's still like being worked out. It sounds like I'm like, uh, it doesn't sound like it's really working at least what it was intended to do because like somebody pointed out that if uh, under employment, uh, status, you you should be guaranteed like a minimum wage. Like if you work like a service industry yeah. job and you yeah, don't make yeah. the fifteen dollars an hour, your employer has to subsidize your check. But that's not happening, right? No, that's that's not happening. Um, yeah, it's it's the only benefit that has you know come from this whole situation, or is that hey we can unionize there you because go. we're employees, we can do that. That was never possible before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the bright side. And hopefully that's how you get like all the other stuff in theory, you know, if you're, uh, if you're looking at this from a big theory brain point of view. Um, I guess I was also curious about like, challenges you might face when attempting this sort of thing in specifically the adult entertainment industry, because it seems like there are people that aren't going to be taking uh, what you do seriously as labor. That's like a, a thing you hear a lot. That's fucking stupid. Um, yeah. I've been These doing wars. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I do a joke about this in my act right now where I, you know, talk about sex work and how people don't do this. And it's like, um, you know, the, basically the point I'm making is like uh, I'm getting paid to do this. You know, like talk about come for half an hour on a stage like that's arguably dumber you know than anything you would argue it's a fucking skill my man <laughs> i know but if like the point being if i'm getting paid for that you should get paid for what you do like these are both jobs you know like i have a very dumb job there are dumb jobs and uh the, the legitimacy argument of jobs is like you know i stupid argument totally respect sex work his work etc all that stuff but like people don't and i um i guess I'm both cons like I'm curious about whether you know there's shit you get even like from people on your own side of the industry or outside of it or also like um, <sighs> whether because there's this thing that happens in comedy where like we talk about unionizing sometimes but the problem we have is that there's no solidarity because everybody kind of like wants to work so uh, yeah. there's scabs you know yeah um, is that a thing I mean have you had uh, hell yeah I mean you know all these women, they have their own reasons for working and, you know, and, you know, and, and also in the industry, the culture is very, you know, every stripper for themselves, you know, let's, it's very competitive. So it is not normal for women to get together and, and, and unionize. And we, we do have, you know, scabs, you know, <laughs> um, that are currently dancing at our club and, you know, I mean, I, you know, 
you can be like compassionate about the situation and be like, hey, they have their own reasons. Or you can be like, why aren't they joining our movement? Don't they see that things could get better? You know, and then, you know, I, I do feel like we are on the winning side. And and I do believe that things are going to get better. And but also, you know, people are people. And I don't know. I don't want to judge anyone. It just is what it is. Yeah, um, we live in America as, where people don't really yeah. even understand like, yeah. what you're doing. It's a very really. yeah. This is America. Everyone, you know, is it's it's very like it's very like look out for yourself only. That is very yeah, very very normal in this country. <laughs> yeah, totally. but uh, as as for like the shade that we get from people, oh yeah, like we have people, uh, you know, you know, they generally don't respect, you know. Uh, culturally like they don't really respect what women do as as mothers as educators we get paid less in this country so then just imagine a stripper you know yeah. there's just like ah, oh, we hate you know a lot of hate a lot of horophobia a lot of this that isn't a real job you're just getting naked but you know the reality there is a lot of work that goes into that job you know, you have to learn to be able to talk to all types of different people, be able to negotiate, be able to sell, be able to dance, to be able to, you know, uh, I mean, even the splits, that's hard as fuck, you know? <laughs> oh, I can't do that shit. Yeah, you guys and, do that lockers back there. That means that's yeah. a real job, in my opinion, you know? There, it's it's definitely one of the hardest jobs that I've had. And um, I, I enjoy it because it does give me it gives me time and it I, I get to be my own boss and, you know, and, and there's a lot of benefits to it. But there's also, you know, a lot of things that suck about it. Obviously, you know, here we are having this conversation about, you know, how how shitty this club is. But, yeah, you know, I don't know what can I can say about all the hate, but we're getting a lot of love. So, you know, what you focus on expands <laughs> and um, and as you know, as we share our story and people start to learn more that strippers are people and we're just like you and we're also working class. And this is also, you know, a feminist movement as well. Um, you know, more people can be, can open their minds and, and, and get more, get more information. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, you're, you seem like you're in good spirits about that. That's fucking yeah. great. <laughs> um, I guess I just had like a couple more questions and then we can probably wrap this up um, and we can get back to fighting the good fight. I, one thing I read about kind of off on a tangent here, but can you talk a little bit about like the racial discrimination aspect of this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we are light skinned and we are white. And that is because this club, it's the only workforce that this club will hire. They I like at the whole time that I've been at this club, I have watched them turn away like five black dancers right at the door. Didn't even let them audition, just said, hey, we're not hiring. And, you know, this club for the longest time needed more dancers, more employees. And they were even forcing us to work more days because they don't have enough people working there. So I'm over here slaving away, working five days a week. I'm fucking tired. And I see this beautiful black woman at the door. I'm like, fucking please hire her. <laughs> yeah, no and they just they just send send them away. And and it's and that and that's really common in L.A. The clubs are racist. And I, and I you know, we definitely should be talking more about it so we can do something to you know change that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, um, I mean, speaking of, you know, what, can you summarize what the, you know, what the basic demands of the strike are? Oh, hold up. I think we have like a whole document. Here. Well, I'll just, I'll just phrase it. So we want, we want to be able to go to security and, and actually have them help us. We want to, rehire the dancers that were fired for asking for you know who had safety concerns we also want to renegotiate our contract and i mean there's definitely more stuff i'd probably have to have in front of me i'm professional you know oh all good i think i sprung <laughs> it on you i've but got those it are, those are those are the base like we're not asking for much you know yeah. we're asking for really basic stuff hang on i think i've got it actually on my oh my god read it <laughs> um <laughs> Um, let's see. 
Okay, yeah, in the article here on Knock LA, it says, um, the petition demanding that management immediately reinstate fired dancers, affirm that we will not be fired for standing up for ourselves in dangerous situations with customers when we call on security to protect us and when we bring issues to the attention of management, enforce a strict policy that no customers can film or photograph dancers in the club, enforce a strict policy that no customers can remain in the club after closing unless they are actively getting a lap dance, stop over serving customers mm -hmm. that seems important uh issue us copies of our signed contracts and an employee handbook listing all of star gardens work rules and policies including policies towards customers very smart um and give security authorization to respond to our calls immediately without going to management first which is what we talked about earlier so yeah, that, that all sounds very reasonable we're, we're just asking them to do their job it's pretty basic yeah and uh, then yeah <laughs> <laughs> And that's all stuff that I guess, uh, you know, the reason I'm talking about this on a podcast is people hearing it might not realize that that isn't already stuff that is happening behind the scenes at the place you go to get drunk and throw dollar bills around every weekend with your friends, yeah. you know? <laughs> this is, uh, it's important to illuminate, right? Um, cool. Well, Tess, thank you so much for, uh, for talking to us a little bit and, uh, you know, and putting the word out about the strike. Um, could you please plug, like, let us know how we can support and stuff like that. I know you've got events yeah, coming up and stuff absolutely. like that. Absolutely. So you can follow us on Instagram, um, stripper strike noho. That's one word. Um, we have, um, a link tree that has access to, um, our petition, our action fund, our fundraiser that we're having, uh, May 30th. Um, at, uh, the federal NoHo. Uh, you can buy tickets if you're in LA. I definitely, um, think you should come. You should absolutely come. It's, it's going to be a blast. It's going to feature all of our dancers. Well, most of them. Um, and it's going to be union themed. Um, Love but it. yeah, you can either follow our Instagram or you can follow our Twitter. Our Twitter is slightly different. It's just strip strike NoHo, all one word. Cool. Uh, I'll put all this stuff in the show notes. Um, yo, actually, we should tell me a little bit about the a union themed, like dancing and stuff. That's pretty cool. That seems like something we should hear about. Uh, I saw somebody dressed up like an OSHA worker, <laughs> like one of the, yeah, man. <laughs> uh, our, 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 our protest, our pickets are super fun. Cause we always come up with themes and, um, we, you know, after we reported all the violations to OSHA, we, we showed up as broken glass, bug, uh, bugs, <laughs> rats, um, the, the, you know, it, and we, we have a lot of fun out on the picket line. We've had, um, matrix theme. We had, a uh, um, brave heart. <laughs> that was definitely one of my favorites. That rules. But yeah, every every week we're we're out there protesting in front of the strip club um, to you know to educate people about hey what's going on and don't come in this place. And uh, yeah, we vote on themes and we have fun out there. So if anything, people are having more fun on the picket line than in the strip club. There you go. It's just warm beer and maybe like two two <laughs> two tired dancers. Yeah, yeah, the real parties outside. I love it. All right, cool. Thank you so much, Tess. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I think that's I think we're good. That's All a right, podcast. Thank you. <laughs>